the, the stop that we're going to go ahead um, and, and go to here is how do we unlock the nutrients in our soil bank? Okay, Ron and Jim talked about how we need boron in zinc, and we need we know that today is going to talk a lot about nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. Well, guess what? We have a lot of that fertility in our soils, right? Okay, I'm a really big fan of writing smaller checks in in comparison to larger checks. So if this nutrient bank is available to our crop, guess what? We don't have to spend money at the local co-op. So. When we think about unlocking that nutrient bank, you know, going back to that barrel and stave concept, <clears throat> we typically have two limiting factors in our, in our yield equation, regardless of where we're at. Number one is water, right? It's either too much or too little, and we're all farmers, so it's one or the other, and we're never quite happy with it. And number two is our fertility, our mobile nutrients, okay? We gotta think about how some of these nutrients get to our rooting system. We have mass flow nutrients, right? That's what comes up to the plant through our water, okay? Nitrogen, sulfur, more of these mobile nutrients in our soil. But how do we get phosphorus? How do we get boron? A lot of you guys see uh, calcium deficiency in season. How does the plant pick up those nutrients? We gotta get roots in contact with those nutrients, right? We gotta unlock that soil bank. So as we pass, Gonna, gonna pass by a population study here, okay? We've got twin 20s, and Greg talked a lot about this from the main stage, okay? We've got different hybrids out here. We have different leaf architecture. And end of the day, it's about capturing as much sunlight as possible. And I encourage you guys to come back later because obviously there's plots behind you as well. But when we think about light capture, okay? This is a, this is a factory. How do, we, how do we give that plant everything that it possibly wants? while at the same time not limiting the nutrients that we can do something about. So here uh, we have plots that are 24, 34, 44, and 54,000, okay? So when we think about planting population, you know, we really gotta think about these dollars and cents, right? It's, it's nice to talk about a planting population, but every thousand seeds that we increase, that's four bucks, right? So if we increase 10,000, that's $40. Okay, that's sizable. Okay, that's the most per acre that you're going to get in, in, in respect to an input to that acre as we possibly can. So how do we maximize that hybrid's potential? And, and you guys saw a lot of that light capture early. Okay, behind you, uh, you'll be seeing a lot of tillage demos. Okay, 360 bullet. Uh, that'd be the second thing we talk about while we're out here. And like I was saying, the first thing that we're going to focus on is that first limiting factor is water. Okay, too much or too little. Okay, if you're not under pivots, okay, what's our second biggest yield limiting factor? We have water sit there. We denitrify that nitrogen. We leach sulfur through our soil profile. Okay, you guys on sands, you know exactly what too much water does. It means all your fertility is about three feet deep. So how do we, how do we go about limiting that bottom stave of the barrel as much as humanly possible, right? We haven't quite developed a rain machine. We'll talk about that at the 2027 Proving Grounds. But, uh, you know, how do we get rid of that excess water, okay? Our, our fertility changes, our pH, as they talked about earlier, when we have saturated soils, we can see that differ. So Mark Schwartz is going to come up here and, uh, and talk to you a lot about the tiling system, what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, it's a large investment, but we do that investment for a reason. Show of hands real quick. How many of you guys have tile on your fields? How many are still thinking about tiling? What's the first activity you do once you buy ground? Sock tile in it, right? Okay, so before we go ahead and uh, sock a bunch of money in terms of fertility, we got to make sure that, wa that soil profile, that water availability is in the right place to start with. So Mark is going to join me here. Hello, I'm Mark Shorts with 360 Water Solutions on the tile lead. 360 Water Solutions is a regional based tiling and excavating company with crews located in Seidel, Illinois and here in Tremont, Illinois. Three years ago, when Greg and I first met, we were actually tiling on this farm, helping his farm team tile on this Proving Grounds farm. It was very clear to me that Greg and myself shared a true passion for drainage. 
we knew that drainage was the key to high yields. We had both seen the benefits of drainage on our own family farms. This is uh, on our farm in Sidel, Illinois, pattern tile versus the neighbors with no pattern tile. So Greg and I decided to start Water Solutions to help growers capture or take more control of, of their water and capture more yield for their farms. We not only wanted to help growers become more successful, but we also wanted to help growers change the farms for generations to come. I'll, I just want to say that we believe there's no one size fits all for drainage. So what I'd like to do is come out, meet with the grower, figure out their needs, and then we'll decide after we run a RTK survey, we'll decide what the best approach for that farm is. So I'll do a drainage design and we'll either do a, a planned, a phased approach, if that's what, what the grower requires, or we'll do it where we can do a complete system. So what we look at is on a farm, we look at the soil type as our driving factor for lateral spacing, depth, and size. So on this Proving Grounds farm, this is a picture of us a couple winters ago installing the tile. It's four inch laterals on 60 foot spacings. So what are the, some of the services that we provide? Uh, 360 Water Solutions provides, provides professional uh, plan and design services. We also plow tile up to 12 inch single wall and we trench tile up to 42 inch dual wall. One thing that's great about our team is we've got a bunch of young guys, hardworking guys, two crews, and we're able to travel to get your large projects done. And we're also able to split up to, to either pull both crews together to get large projects done or to split up to get smaller, uh, more timeliness to your field. Another thing that we've done here at 360 is we've worked with other people in the ag industry this slide shows this late last winter, we worked with Bex Hybrids down in Effingham, Illinois at their practical farm research facility, installing a drainage water management study. We, t we did some 15 inch, 15 foot spacings on the contour, and then also did a tile. Tile depth spacing um, study as well. So we're really excited to share with our growers the results from that study as Bex harvest it here this fall. Another thing that's exciting, working in collaboration with a neighboring drainage contractor, we're now able to run this uh, Barber Green trencher and able to install 30 to 42 inch dual wall uh, with a trencher. So always before we've had to install big dual wall with an excavator, now we're able to install 30 to 42 inch dual wall with a trencher. So we're really excited because this sets the stage. There's a lot of big uh, mains county mains, district mains, that are gonna need to be replaced in the next several years. This sets the stage so we'll be able to be in position to, to do that work for you. As you can see the sign here on this trailer, we work with Springfield Plastics. We install Springfield pipe. We believe that their pipe with 100% virgin resin is the best product on the market. You know, when you're looking at an investment that's gonna last the next, hopefully over 100 years, we feel that quality and service is more important than the cheapest pipe, pipe out there. So we're gonna have them pull ahead a little bit up to the Buckeye Trencher, and we're gonna install some dual wall live in front of you. This is a 7200 Buckeye, capable of trenching up to 24 inch dual wall. Here today, we're trenching in 18 inch dual wall. We have a plunger in the boot. Stephanie, I'll, I'll go to the next one and you can hit the, the play. We have a plunger in the boot. This is 18 inch pipe from Springfield Plastics. And the plunger will bell the pipe together. This eliminates the need for a guy in the bottom of the boot to put in a screw or prevent the bells from coming apart as we're trenching forward. So you can see we use an auger backfiller to backfill. And again, this is 18 inch dual wall trenching in from Springfield Plastics with a Buckeye.
This ground is really, really hard, as Greg said. We've, uh, we're cutting pretty wide. You can see there's a little bit of hop in the wheel at the tires, but if you look at the wheel that's doing our grading, the back of the wheel and the shoe, there's a little movement in the very back. That's where we're RTK grading. We're running an infield base station and running it with Trimble RTK grade control. We're also able to put a stone box on the back of this boot. If county mains require the dual wall to be installed with stone backfill, we can put a rock box on the back and backfill the pipe with rock as well. So what Barry's doing there, he's pulling the pipe back, he's putting it in the boot. Once it clears, he'll set it down, and then he's got a remote control that'll run the plunger inside the boot. So we'll go ahead and pull up to the 2050 inner drain. We run two 2050 inner drain tile plows. The inner drain is a 540 horsepower, close to 80,000 pound machine. We're capable of plowing single wall tile up to 12 inch. Here we're putting four inch laterals on 30 foot spacings. The main reason here we're doing 30 foots is so we have enough room over the course of the show to do one run each session. But as I said before, this farm is tiled on 60 foot, four inch laterals. So you'll notice we have an onboard reel and a power puller and power feeder to prevent stretch on the tile or to, to reduce stretch on the tile. We're also using white tile from Springfield Plastics. In the summer months, the black tile with the sun heats up and the white tile stays a lot cooler. That also helps reduce stress, stretch. One thing to notice on the back of the four inch boot, we have a cutter crusher. So at the end of the run, this increases efficiency because the operator doesn't have to get off the plow, put an end cap and plug it. Instead, he can cut and crush the tile and pull up and go to the next run. So we'll go ahead and run a, a run here. It's kind of hard on a, a 200 foot run to really show you how we can get up to speed, but Chet's gonna nose into the, the dirt there and get it going. You'll notice being such a big plow, it's nice and stable. They do a great job grading. We're able to go in a lot of different conditions. This plow is also RTK grade controlled with Trimble and it's, and it's RTK auto steer as well. Okay, we'll go ahead and pull up to the bioreactor. Stephanie, can you move that? I'm not, it's not good, is it? You go ahead and move it forward. So you see he's cutting and crushing and pulling forward so it's out of his boot and then he'll pull up and then go back to the next run. You can tell with 3,400 feet on a roll that in a large, large field, it's very productive for us. We can get a lot of footage in in a day and getting a very quality job with that plow. So I wanna talk a little bit about managed drainage. As I, as I mentioned at Bex Hybrids, we worked with them on a drainage controlled project. Uh, 360 Water Solutions and Springfield Plastics believe the goal for improving water quality and also um, increasing crop production can be achieved by a thing we like to call managed drainage. Managed drainage, there's three different types. Drainage water management, saturated buffer strips, and a bioreactor. What we used here at the Proving Grounds, what we installed, Stephanie, go ahead and one more. What we installed is a bioreactor. So what a bioreactor does is it takes the water from our tile main, diverts it into the bioreactor chamber. A lot of people ask, they worry about putting a structure or a bioreactor in. What's it going to do to the flow of the tile? In a high flow situation, the tile will go on out the outlet. In a low flow situation, using baffles, the water is diverted into the bioreactor chamber. The bioreactor is lined in plastic to prevent the dirt from mixing with the wood chips. There's a manifold, so the, the, the water goes into the bioreactor on solid pipe. There's a manifold at this closer end to you on the west. 
which is perforated. The water will travel through the wood chips. The real action in a bioreactor occurs with the wood chips in the bioreactor. The denitrifying bacteria in the wood chips use the carbon at, from, the, from the wood chips as a food source and break down the nitrates in the water into nitrogen gas. There's a return manifold on the other end, a, a perforated pipe on the other end of the bioreactor that then loops the water around to the chamber and out the outlet. So we're really excited. This is our first bioreactor we've installed. This is gonna be a working bioreactor. So next year at Proving Grounds, we'll be able to test the water quality coming into the bioreactor, see how it works, test the efficiency, test the water going out of the nitrate levels and the water going out of the bioreactor. There's a lot of questions on how long a bioreactor is gonna last. Um, that's in the wood chip quality and there's a lot of research that needs to be done to that. So what we're hoping to do is install one so we can track, see how it goes. NRCS currently is saying that a bioreactor wood chips will last 10 years. Then the wood chips would have to be replaced, not the whole system, not the structure, the pipes, but just the wood chips. Now you can either fill the whole bioreactor up all the way to the top with wood chips, or you can fill within two foot to the top, put uh, geofabric on and then put dirt and you can reseed over it. But normally the bioreactor is placed, you know, close to an outlet like we have it, um, you know, in a CRP or that type of situation. So we'll go ahead and turn if the tram driver wants to go ahead and turn and I'll talk just a little bit more. So we have, uh, we still have room this fall for tiling projects. It's filling up fast, but we'd love to talk to you guys at the show. Well, you're more than welcome. I know the visibility is a little bit limited over here, but you're more than welcome to come back, look at the bioreactor, look into the structure, talk to any of our team. Um, we're excited to you know, talk to you about any drainage needs, water management needs on your farm, and really excited to be able to share some of this data with you, uh, both from the Bex uh, drainage water management study and also from our own bioreactor as we get the bioreactor up and running. So I'll turn it over to Stephanie as we move back north. And she'll kind of set the stage, I think, for the Ripper Pit just a little bit. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. Anybody have any quick questions for Mark uh, before he jumps off for the next tram? Yeah, so we're walk working with Dr. Cook at the U of I to... Um, Mark, what was the question again? I'm sorry. How, many, how big does the bioreactor be? Um, so there's... They're able to, does all these projects, these bioreactors will be engineered to be installed. And so actually we have a larger reactor here than what we needed to, to have just to kind of show you the size for this five acres that we're draining. Yeah, it's just the five acres, correct. So we, you know, there's that, that basically you would go to a, someone that's certified to design a bioreactor. So I don't, I don't have any data exactly for you, but we would be able to look at the watershed that's going into the, the bioreactor and then be able to size it accordingly. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the, the, Bex, uh, the Bex drainage water management study, we worked with Agrim as well. And they had, we were tiling on the contours using control structures and pumping water back through. So there is a section of that, of that plot that uh, is dedicated to sub-irrigation back through the tile. Okay, Dennis. Yep. Okay, fantastic. So, Mark, thank you so much. You know, the first step, taking care of that groundwater. Do we have that crop in a rooting system, thank you, that can fully pull, you know, every nutrient out of that soil bank as we possibly can? Okay, the next stop that we're going to talk about is a tillage demonstration. Uh, we have a product called 360 Bullet. Okay, it's a ripper point. So first and foremost, I know that I've given a lot of summer meetings so far. So if you're in a no-till situation, if you're in a strip-till situation, great. Let's keep it that way. Let's make sure we have our compaction taken care of, that we're, we're, we're going to measures to assess it. But what's the whole idea of tillage? Okay, the whole idea of tillage is to eliminate any, you know, 
gradient difference density within that soil. So when we till, let's make sure that in our mind, what we're thinking we're trying to accomplish is the same thing that we're actually accomplishing with that tillage pass. So with that, um, Tim is going to start this conversation uh, talking about all of the options on the marketplace and how we fully unlock that potential of that, of that soil profile. Okay, so as Stephanie was just setting us up, uh, we're talking here in the second half of this session uh, about what happens in our soil uh, in our fall tillage pass. If you think about this session in general, what we're really talking about here is soil. Obviously, it's the foundation of everything we're doing. It's the foundation of our yield. And what Mark just showed you with the tile side, that's obviously a long-term investment you're making in your soil, uh, a long-term investment that has a lot of payback. What we're talking about here is more that annual investment that we're making. What are we doing every fall, in this case, with this type of tillage, to come into this soil, invest in a pass, pay for the fuel that pass, and as we go through there, what are we doing with these rippers? What's our goal? We really have three goals when you think about making a pass with a deep ripper. The first is we got to mix and incorporate. And what are we mixing and incorporating into our soil? Residue, uh, nutrients, perhaps lime, if that was part of your uh, rec for that fall. Uh, in many cases, we're coming back into our fields with lime on a more regular basis, trying to keep our levels more consistent versus allowing our pHs to go up and down. And so that's the first step you're going to want to take with a ripper like this is we're going to come in and we want to incorporate. Second, we want to fracture. So as we talked in the morning session, as dad covered that, the soil collapses throughout the season. That's the clay por portion of our soil. The clay particle, as it dries out, those clay lattices will collapse. We see our soil start to crack and develop those cracks throughout the summer. And depending on the season you have will change how aggressive that that collapsing is and part of what you want to try to accomplish when you make a pass like this is resetting that soil. That's the natural kind of compaction or collapsing that occurs. We also see what we put in, the compaction that we put in. If this was a combine track that ran across here, we're going to see a lot tighter soil, a lot more compacted soil and there's been a lot of work done on the cost of compaction. You guys know that well, that that's a big yield robber for us and that's part of what we're trying to do when we come in with a ripper like this is to eliminate that compaction or reset that soil density, that soil profile from the collapsing that occurred throughout the summer. Third and final step is to level that soil surface. We'll look at that on the far end of our pit here. As we think about making a pass with the ripper, we've got to leave it in the right condition to go into the next season. So this is really step one of 2017. As you make this pass here this fall after the combine goes through, you're starting your, your season, your 2017 season this fall. So you got to have your, your head in the game, have that mindset of how am I leaving my soil as, I, as this ripper goes through, how level is that surface, and how consistent is it throughout this entire process from start to finish. So what our, we're looking at in our pit here is both the residue incorporation on the top, the levelness, as well as the fracturing underneath. So we're just going to walk through a little bit of what we ran in this pit for you to see. We've got two different types of rippers we've used. They're both parked on the ends of the pit. Behind me is a Blue Jet inline ripper. We call it an inline ripper because if you look here at our shanks, the shanks are all in line. Five like this, seven if we fold down the top two there. And this ripper is very focused on soil fracturing, not so much on residue incorporation. We'll talk more about that. On the other end is our V ripper. We use both of these in our system. As you look down to the, to the far end there, this ripper has three stages. Front disc, those are what we use to mix residue or nutrients into the soil. We've got our set of shanks there in the middle. We call it a V ripper because it's got a leading shank right in the center of the machine. And then in a V shape, the shanks continue to progress out and to the rear. And then at the back of the machine, we have our leveling system. So three stages that each address one of the areas we talked about things we're focused on when we go ahead and make a, a deep tillage pass like we're doing here. Okay, so let's then compare these two in the pit. As you look here, this first pass was done with an inline ripper. And let's focus first on residue. So when we think about residue or anything we're surface that we want to incorporate, uh, let's compare these two rippers. As I mentioned earlier, this ripper's not really built to incorporate. So with our inline pass, 
we're going to look first at the surface. In our operation, we're not typically using an inline ripper in these kind of conditions. So th this is our, our corn on corn type pattern of what we're setting up to do here. And this kind of residue left on the surface is a lot more than what we want in our operation. This ripper is used in soybean ground for us, going back into corn. And where we're trying to come back in and fracture the soil, that's really where this ripper has a place. There's no disc up front of, to really speak of to incorporate the residue that we see here on the surface. So you can see almost everything that was left here by the combine when we brought it through is still up here on the surface and hasn't really been incorporated. As you compare that, as I cross this flag line right here, now I'm stepping into the pass that we made with the V-Ripper, and you can notice a big difference. If you look right down this line to my left and your left, you can see the residue left on the surface versus over here. The depth that those discs were running at is about four inches. You can see that left as, uh, as kind of an archaeologist. If you dig this out and you're looking for the evidence, you can find it where those discs ran. If you look at the top of the mounds here, you'll see a narrower portion. Right here at the base of that is our disc depth. If you look up ahead, that's about four inches. You want to run that depth to, uh, based on what you're looking for on the surface as far as how much uh, dark soil you want left versus residue cover. Changes a little bit as you change the depth of those discs. Uh, and so in this case, we're running about four inches. So as we run these machines, what we see is those front discs do that work for us, the majority of that incorporation. The shank has some role to play, but it's not nearly as significant compared to what we're seeing up front. So when it comes to incorporating residue, we're using a V-style ripper, we're not using an inline, and it's really for the reason that you see here as far as what's left. Why are we wanting to mix in residue? Well, it kind of uh, uh, makes sense when you think about mineralization. We talked about that in the morning. Uh, as we size residue, and we're focused on that with uh, the corn head, we then need to incorporate it to really get the benefits out of giving Mike the best chance to break down this residue as quickly as possible. We've got to serve it to him. And that's what we're doing here. By taking it off the surface, we're exposing more of that residue to the soil, more of it to the biological system, which speeds up that breakdown process. That's one aspect. So it's less time immobilizing, more time mineralizing. Another aspect of it is emergence and ear count. When you think about uh, what residue does on the surface, it keeps the soil cooler, especially if it's moved some during the, the fall and winter, if it's started to, to create rings or anything like that, you're going to see that show up in emergence because of cooler soil temperatures. We also see challenges with the planter. I've dug a lot of late emergers myself. Most often you find residue in that root ball or near that seed that caused that plant to misfire and become too late compared to its neighbors. So by taking this residue and working it in, we're serving it to Mike, and we're also getting it out of the way for our seed that's coming back in this next spring. It's not to say you can't be successful in more of a no-till type situation. I'm sure many of you on the tram right now are successful with that type of system. It's more difficult. You've really got to be on top of your game, especially with your planter and how you're managing what's left here on the surface. Uh, we've got a plot uh, a couple miles from here. We're seeing, comparing more no-till versus more tillage, we're seeing about a 2,000 plants or ears difference uh, between those two systems. And that's, uh, you know, seven bushel per thousand. So that's a pretty significant difference that you really got to be on top of. So in our, certainly in our corn-on-corn -corn type system, taking care of this residue has some big gains to it. So as an industry, we've spent a lot of time in tillage looking at the surface both in incorporation and in levelness. But we really think it's time to go underground and be more focused on what's happening below. And that's what we've done here at 360. Our team has spent a lot of time focused on what does it take to do that second step to consistently fracture the soil all the way across the machine. You know, as we make an investment, and that's really what this is, as you spend the time and fuel and equipment costs to make this pass, we think you need to be doing the most that, that you possibly can there and fracturing this entire profile. There's several advantages to that. When we think about our two different styles of ripper, you can see some differences here. I mentioned earlier the inline is really built to fracture. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that's not exactly what you see in this pit. We'll talk about why that is. The concept of the inline is to have the shanks paired up with each other side by side, so 30 inches apart in this case. And as those shanks run forward through the soil, the soil is lifted by the two shanks, starts to come up in a wave, and you'll see it reach out the back and break off. 
And you'll see those kind of cookie cutter cracks running this way where the ripper ran in and out of the pit wall. You'll see horizontal cracks running the other way where the soil came up and broke off. If you see that pattern out of your inline ripper, you know you're doing a good job. That's exactly what you want to see out of that machine. If you saw that, in this case, we would see a lot more consistent soil fracture than we see in this particular pit. Typically, you'll see two, at most three inches up off the base of the shank. You'll see the soil break all the way across to horizontal crack develop, this whole area being broken out. This side of the machine is doing a little better if you look especially up towards the face wall of the pit than on this side. What we'll see on an inline ripper, though, is there's a couple things you really have to pay attention to to have it consistently fracture. There's three areas to look at. First is soil moisture. The wetter it is, the harder it is for those two shanks to lift that profile and drop it. It tends to be stickier. The shank just slides through, creates a slot, and it won't fracture as much. And you can tell that that's probably what happened here. And I can tell you that's true. Just like any other farm, Proving Grounds is no different. We have to work with the weather. And in this case, uh, we've been blessed with a lot of good rainfall, but it's made this job of making this pit a lot more challenging for Tony and I. So last week, we'd already had a couple of inches of rain, and it started to dry down. We had a narrow window to put the pit in, and we went for it. And so that's part of what's showing up here as far as our inline not performing like we typically would see, not doing as well as we would see, is there was higher moisture than what we would want. Two other things to pay attention to if you're running this type of machine, depth and speed. Okay, you need a lot of energy as you run through this soil to lift that profile. So the higher the speed, the better. And then the depth is also critical. And the rule of thumb on that is it's half the, the depth should be half of the width between the shanks. So we've got a 30 inch here. We want to be about 15 inches deep or more if we can get it. And it all depends on what kind of horsepower you have up front. Uh, the more the better when it comes to uh, an inline ripper. As you know, they pull pretty hard. Uh, we have drip tape, as you know, on this farm. That always makes us a little nervous. And so we probably were a little shallower than we, than we should have been to get better performance out of this machine. So a little bit of an explanation of what we're seeing in this pit, but typically you would see this machine fracture really consistently when the conditions are right. So if I step across the line now, now we're stepping into the V-Ripper. In this case, as we talked about, the shanks aren't in alignment. They're not really working together. It's that mixing and boiling pattern we see. There's some advantages to that, but the big disadvantage is what's left here behind as far as what we see under the soil profile. And we've dug behind a lot of rippers over the last year, and we really see this consistent hill and valley kind of pattern left behind. So what's causing that? Well, we mentioned the shank, in this case, is out of alignment with each other. There's a 7-inch point, typically, on these shanks that's running up through here, 24 inches spaced apart. And all the energy from that shank is pointed more vertically into the, into the sidewall. We're really fracturing the area where the shank itself runs. We're making actually fine particles up here, but the soil left in between is as hard as we found it. So you can see these are solid. They baked down a little bit, but I can tell you they were like that when we dug them out the first day. The, basically, this ripper is leaving the soil, about 40% or more of it, exactly as it found it. So we talked about what's going to cause that soil to collapse, drying out, clay particles shrinking down, the tire track that's running through here. Whatever you have in your operation, based on your soil, based on your tillage or on your uh, traffic patterns, is what you're going to find here in these mounds. So your roots are going to find that as well. You know, if we take a probe up behind this ripper right after it runs, and you come through and probe, you're going to be able to feel this. There's no doubt about it as you work your way through. You'll drop in here because it's loose, and you'll hit up on top right here. So as your roots bulk up in that loose soil texture that we've left behind in the shank zone, it's going to struggle when it hits here because this density is dramatically different than it is in the center. And so we want to focus on how do we break these mounds and how do we fracture with a V-Ripper that has certainly its advantages. When you look at the residue on top or the levelness, there's a lot we like about this machine, but this is not one of those things. This inconsistent fracturing we see for the investment we're making in that pass doesn't make sense to us. Why don't we work on, and this is the question we asked ourselves, why don't we work on developing something that we can retrofit under our V-Rippers that will cause it to fracture more like an inline ripper should and what you would typically see there. And so one good example of that that we'll see is uh, if you run a sprayer across, Tony's got a video for us, one question we'll get is, well, what about freezing and thawing? 
Seems like freezing and thawing is gonna break these up. Are those really there? If I come through and I find them in the fall, are they gonna be there the next season? If you look right at the nose of the machine, you'll see it walking back and forth. This is Matt Foes, one of our rams. And Matt's running at about a two degree angle compared to where he ripped with a standard V-ripper in this first video. And you can see the sprayer is still finding that track. It's walking left and right. If you watch on that video, you can see that machine walking back and forth. He then went in an area where he'd run with the bullet point that we're gonna show you in a second, where we did fracture more consistently. And if you watch again the nose of the machine, you're gonna see that it's running a lot straighter. So it's good evidence to say freezing and thawing alone isn't gonna break up this kind of structure that we're leaving behind this machine. We're still finding evidence of it the following spring, the following summer, it's still there. So as I mentioned as a team, we've asked ourselves this question, how can we break up these mounds? How can we get this ripper to consistently fracture? Tony joined our team and uh, we started with him to, to answer that question. We had a couple guys jump on this project for us and I'm gonna let Tony talk through how that project went and a little bit of what we went through. Good, thanks Tim. <clears throat> so if you look here as, uh, as the tram pulls up, um, these are basically your, your traditional OEM points or aftermarket points. And you can see what they leave behind. We took these and ran several, several tests to see if there was a point out there on the market that could get the full fracture. And what you see here is what's available out there. And so we, we weren't satisfied with this. Yes, here, here you have one that has a 10 inch wing did better, still left the hump. And you move across here, you can see, if you guys know the, the different brands and stuff, you can see that some of those are, are kind of some of the preferred points out there, and they're still leaving that hump or berm. So we went after, how can we, like Tim mentioned, how can we take that, uh, that V ripper and make it fracture like an inline, still get the, uh, the advantage of incorporating the residue, get the levelness, and so we came through and started the evolution of the 360 bullet point. And we kind of had these covered here so you guys weren't uh, distracted just by looking at all these. So we started off basically a year ago at this time, and we first started printing these on a 3D printer. So this is actually a plastic point that's uh, completely solid plastic, and we ran these in the ground. Well, obviously, you're not going to get too many uh, passes with a plastic point until it breaks but it gave us the advantage of quick turnaround. We could iterate day over day, different designs, different shapes. And once we got to the point where we started to understand what was going on under the soil, you could start to see then the evolution. Going across here, you could see we tried some different shapes. Here you can see this one here is 18 inches wide. We actually had nine of those on a machine and ran it and we were able to pull it but, but you, can, you can imagine it, it took a lot of horsepower, right? So that obviously wasn't gonna get it done, right? We didn't want you guys to have to go out there and buy a two or 300 uh, horsepower tractor more than what you had today. We needed to figure out how could we get full fracture but be able to pull it at the same horsepower. So you start to see how these things started to kind of narrow down. We looked at wing, we looked at wing angle, we looked at wing uh, swept how far swept back, you could start to see too that the wings started to creep forward until we have the finished product. This is, this is the production bullet point right here. And as Tim uh, changes those slides, you can see that this point is 14 inches wide, wing to wing. Traditional points are usually seven. You can get some of those 10 inch ones out there, but typically a, a traditional point is seven inches. This one's 14, so it's double the width. The other thing, if you start to notice, I'll sit it out here, is the, the particular shape and design. The wings of how they're designed, the angle, uh, how they're swept back. Also, I mentioned how they're moved forward. Most wings, if you look, are in the back. And this is the key right here. Your nose is creating that first fracture line as it's going through the, the soil. You wanna keep that energy moving out. Like Tim mentioned, if you just have a regular uh, uh, ripper point, a lot of your energy is going forward. And so you're br basically busting up that soil and making it into small fines. What we want is we want that energy to continue to propagate out. So the wings are moved forward and that energy continues moving out. 
So if you do the math, 14 inches wide on a 24 inch spacing, you still have 10 inches of virgin soil where no metal is touching. And if you start to see here on the bullet pit, we are fracturing most of that soil profile. Yeah, you're still going to have that two to three inch hump there, but actually that is, that's favorable, right? You don't want a perfect plane going across there, right? Everybody knows the, the plow pan or the schmear layer. You don't want that. So you want to still have a little bit of that surface unevenness. You can see here where the point ran, the nose and the wings ran. And then you get the, the full fracture because those uh, that nose is penetrating, creating that energy going out, and you're fracturing across from here to here where there's no metal running. You're fracturing that compared to the, the berm or the hump. You might want to talk a bit about wear or yes. durability. Yeah, I forgot about that last time too, so keep me on track here. This is uh, uh, created as a fabricated point, so it has multiple uh, material types. Uh, like a lot of points that are out on the market, we have a chrome nose cap uh, to give you really good uh, abrasive wear right there on the, the nose. And then we spent quite a bit of time uh, figuring out that, that hard surface weld wire. That's not your traditional weld wire that you just buy on any spool. Uh, spent quite a bit of time with, with a manufacturer, and that is a, a type of material that's used in the mining industry quite a bit for hard surfacing their materials and their... Uh, different tools, and so we incorporated that into our design to protect that wing. The other thing is with a fabricated design, you get the structural steel, and that's what gives you the durability, the toughness. So we were able to take good abrasive uh, material that uh, has high wear, basically it's uh, welded on to the structural steel, and then you come in and do the hard surfacing to protect those wings. We spent quite a bit of time testing uh, this point out, and Tim's going to play a video here. This video is uh, this one of these rippers with the bullet point on, and we buried a four foot by four foot by ten foot precast concrete block. Right, so this is a big piece of concrete rebar and uh, reinforced. We buried that ten inches deep, and we took that ripper, one of Greg's rippers, so he didn't personally like us running it into the wall, but we put it on there. And we basically buried the machine in the ground and drove it as fast as we could into that wall, repeatedly, over and over and over again, to get to the point where we were satisfied with uh, how well this uh, point was going to live. So what we like to say is the 360 bullet point is a really rugged point. It's going to be able to last multiple times running into that foundation wall. Uh, I think that's it. I'm going to hand it you back here to Tim. I'm going to see if I can get this mic to work this time. So the other thing I'll mention, you know, as we look at the structure of the soil, uh, we've dug a lot of pits. Uh, Ryan's actually on the tram. Uh, the poor guy, I don't think he would have uh, actually taken the job if we'd have told him when, when we interviewed him how many pits he was going to have to dig uh, right out of school. But uh, he's done a fantastic job for us on this project. And uh, we've done a lot of digging because we really wanted to look at two things. One, what was the condition of the soil like under the point and in between? And then two, what did it look like up on the surface of these pits like we see up here? And Tony already mentioned, I really love the structure that we see left in the soil. We're taking that same amount of energy that we have on this side, but instead of concentrating all of it right into the area where the shank ran, which is making more of a fine structure you can see in here, we've spread that out and you can see more of the macro cracks that are through these areas versus it all being fine structure. We've also looked a lot about what happens underneath the wing, making sure we don't have that kind of plow layer and we've learned a lot about what it takes to do that. You have to have a narrow surface that's actually in contact with the soil. Think about a, a shear on a plow, it's wide, it's running across the ground, kind of like maybe on, uh, take your skid loader blade, you put it down and drag back you can create that smeared kind of surface. In this case, you can see we have a narrow wing here that's actually in contact with the ground, which makes a big difference as far as the structure or the quality of the soil that's left behind. A lot of picks have been dug and a lot of soil types, and we re really like what we see there. So we've looked at incorporating. We've now looked at fracturing consistently, and we're able to do that with the points. Let's talk about the final step, which is levelness. 
you take a broomstick like this as you set up your ripper beginning of the season, throw it out there on the ground where you've been working, as I just did, take a tape measure out and measure your, your low point to your high point. And we're looking to be about two inches. Right there is an inch and three quarters, probably about the same, almost two inches right there. You can see as I come back here, it's maybe three. Not too bad. A lot of rippers today that are out there, the V-style rippers like the one behind me, can really do a good job of leveling the soil, but you have to take some time to make sure you get them set up correctly. If you do take that time, it's capable of doing this kind of finished job compared to what you're going to see as you pull up in this next pass. If your machine won't do this, it's time to get a new machine. It's important to leave the levelness here in the soil surface going into the spring, into the next season. If I drop it here, you can see that the divots and the hill and valley pattern that we have going. In this case, as I put my tape here, almost six inches in that case. Over here, I've got another divot in where the shank ran. This one's about five and a half. And so that kind of pattern is something that's gonna cause you problems going into the spring. As you guys well know, you're gonna have to make at least one aggressive pass, several passes probably, to get this leveled up and get it consistent to run the planter on. Your good ride is gonna struggle when you look at this kind of leftover condition of these kind of valleys into the hill and back into the valley. The other thing you're gonna struggle with is moisture. As you guys well know, again, you leave this kind of divot, water's gonna pool here throughout the winter, this is where the snow is gonna be left, this is where it's gonna be wet, up here on top it's gonna dry, and you're gonna fight that, trying to balance that moisture difference as you go into the next season. So, machines are capable, if yours isn't, I'd sure recommend getting one that is, or adding something to your machine to make it capable, because the technology has really been there. I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of focus has gone in this area, not so much underground, but on the surface, there's been a lot of good work done, and you can see those results. You compare these two passes. So we took the time when we're putting this pit in to set up the machine. I'd say it's time well spent. It's time well invested. So we're going to jump on the tram, and we're going to do a, a race. We'll set this up for you. And what we're looking at, we've got two identical machines. The main question we get with the bullet point is, can I pull it? Um, obviously, that's an area we've put a lot of work into. Uh, even though the point is twice as wide, uh, 14 inches versus 7 traditionally, which is what we've got on our machine, uh, we, we can pull these points almost the same as what the points are working for you right now. So to set up our test a little bit is we're going to go out to our, our field here where our race is going to happen. We've got our machine that's taken off right here, 875, 9460 deer, pulling it, nine shank ripper. And uh, when we talk about setting up machines, we've certainly spent the time on these two to get them to be identical. We've done a lot of work on these. If you think about um, the different settings on this machine, our front disc depth, uh, we've got cylinder stops in place to go ahead and uh, make sure our depth is identical on the front. We've done the same thing on the levelers on the rear of the machine, uh, making sure those are identical. And the same way then on the depth of our shanks. Uh, we probably checked uh, each ripper, both sides of the machine, probably eight, maybe ten times, making sure the depth is the same. Both of these rippers are running 11 inches deep. Probably, probably deeper than, uh, than most of the, uh, where you'll see these rippers run. We tend to run deep in our operation. We're trying to get down to our AB horizon. If you look in the root, uh, root pit back where we started this morning, take a look over lunch, walk down to that front row, you can see the soil color change as we move to, from our A horizon into our B horizon, and that's where we're targeting our depth when it comes to these uh, ripper passes. Uh, we've got our two operators uh, running these machines. Uh, we've talked through how we're going to do this test to keep it consistent. And what you're looking at there is basically the RPM. We've taken the auto transmission off, and we're shifting based on RPM. 1950, they'll shift up. 1700, they'll shift back down. So we're consistently shifting across the two machines um, as we go across this race. So depth is the same across the whole machine, even the turnbuckle we measured to make sure that setting was the same. And we're going to line them up side by side. And we'll show you the difference. Any questions while we're making the trip over? Yes. Good question. The question being, 
What do you recommend as far as the direction you're going to face relative to your corn rows? We typically are running at an angle. Uh, how much varies a bit. Uh, I'm sure there'd be some good opinions across the tram as far as what you guys do. But in our case, we're typically running at an angle. A couple degrees, a couple five degree, two to five degree kind of angle. Question being, how do they work in more of a strip tool type scenario? Uh, most of our work has really gone into more the, the V-Ripper kind of pattern. Um, so we really haven't run them on like a strip till bar. They're, they're made to fit on an inch and a half or an inch and a quarter uh, shank. Yeah, they, they will fit an inch and a quarter shank or an inch and a half shank out there in the marketplace. So that, that covers basically all your main uh, V-Rippers out there. But with strip till, we haven't really run this design in that kind of setup. Okay, so we're going to pull alongside. We're running about a 500-foot race here. Yeah, question. Uh, great question. So he says, uh, used to have a case ripper. They'd always have lead shanks. What happened to the lead shanks? Tony actually joined our team from Case. He was in charge of their tillage development group over there. You can answer that question, I'm sure. Yeah, Tony. so the, that's a great question, right? Take the 53730, right? Most of you guys know the DMI turned them red to, to Case IH. They had the lead shank between the 30-inch spacing. They took the lead shank away because of how residue, the hybrid, started coming, right? And you started to have a lot more residue bunching up. So what they did is on the 870, they took the lead shank out and we moved the spacing in the 24, right? And everybody loved, like Tim said, over the last 10 years, the finish has been great, right? But people forgot what was going on under the surface. That lead shank was taking out that berm. You take that lead shank out and you're left with those berms. And so that's why we worked over the last year developing this point to basically work with high residue, right? 875, one of the best machines out there as far as leveling, residue incorporation. And we wanted that same fracture, that same soil profile fracture like an inline ripper. Okay, we'll set up the race here for you guys and get it started. So we've got, as I mentioned, two identical machines, set up identical. So much so that we've even thought about how much fuel is in each tractor. We've got that to be the same, so they have the same weight, same traction. Um, the ripper behind has the case points on it up front. You can see our banner here. It's got the bullet point. You can see down here on the shanks, you see our 14-inch points here. The guys are up on the phone together so they can start each other. So we'll give them the go sign here. As soon as they lower down, they're going to start as good as they can exactly the same time. First race today, we had a one jump the line a little bit, so you guys will have to keep an eye on that, see if that happens. Stephanie's timing for us up here on the screens, and we're going to hit the lap button when the ripper on the far side hits the end point, which you can see up here is our headlands, about 500 feet in that direction. We're going to hit it stop. The other one's going to run through to the finish line, and we'll show you the difference in time. Uh, so, uh, remember, Tim, how they're shifting? Did you go over that? I think on the way we talked a little bit, okay. but basically they're shifting on the RPM. 1950 up, 1700 down, and uh, we're going to see how this race ends up. So I can tell you right up front, a point that's twice as wide probably isn't going to win, but we'll see how close we are. And uh, I think you guys are going to see it's a good investment yeah. as far as the time difference. That's what you want to remember is what you saw over in the pit, right? You saw that soil profile all the way across the machine, and then take it here, and you'll see that there's not much difference as far as the the horsepower or the work or as far as uh, the distance or speed. So let's watch how they compare to each other. It's also a good chance to watch this machine in action. I know this is probably the first time you've been on a bleacher moving at five mile an hour next to a ripper. So take advantage of that opportunity. Start of the race, 
You can see overall we're staying right with it. Just about to hit our end point. He stops. And he stops. So maybe three and a half seconds. I'd have to look here and see. Uh, not even, right? 50. Yeah. So the ripper on the far side, 52 seconds, 65. 53.96, so let's say that's not quite two seconds difference as far as the timing between the two. You also saw the distance, I don't know, maybe 15 feet of difference between the two passes. So really pretty close considering how different it is of what's going on underground between these two machines. And that's where a lot of work went for the team is to figure out how to get these to pull. Those 18-inch points you saw back in the pit, uh, they wouldn't do this. I can tell you right now, um, We'd be back there somewhere halfway through the race about now. So a lot of work went into making sure that these points are something you can pull with the tractor you have. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, obviously, what, 500 feet? So over a half mile, whatever long stretch, you know, your fields might be, there's going to be, you know, a little bit more time there. Consistently, we saw over a half mile pass, probably about a 10 to 12 second difference. So we, we typically say 5% um, difference as far as your speed or, or distance. Yeah. And like we mentioned, so we're, we've got about 460 on nine shanks. Uh, manufacturers recommend 45 to 50 horsepower per shank. Uh, if you look through the guides and the manuals on these machines. So we're running about right in that range. Typically in our operation, we're running a bit more horsepower than that per shank. But we wanted to set them up more to the uh, standards as far as how we're running our race here. So if you do the math in your head of what machine you're running on, what tractor you're running on your ripper, uh, you can do that math on a horsepower per shank and get some idea. The more you have, the tighter the race is going to be. Uh, just it wipes out that difference. The other thing we've seen is the depth you run this ripper at is actually the most significant thing when it comes to this race. Uh, the first practice run, the bullet actually won the race. Um, even after spending quite a bit of time setting the machines up and thought we had them identical, we come back and check. This one was at 10 inches. The one on the back was at 11. So an inch of difference actually changed the outcome of the race. And so the depth you're running at is usually going to be the thing that has the biggest difference. An inch of depth is more significant than seven inches of wing. Yeah, and that's, that's a good point. Just depending on your practices, right, with this, with this ripper point now, you're getting full fracture. So that rule of thumb of going, you know, half, uh, yeah, half whatever the spacing is, so, you know, 24-inch spacing, you would say you'd go 12 inches deep. Now you might consider running a little bit shallower depending on how you uh, have your operation set up. Other questions? Yes? Yep, great question. So the question being, what do we come back with in the spring in our operation? We're using the Great, Pro, uh, Great Plains Turbo Till uh, and run through at a high speed. Uh, we're in all vertical tillage. Um, you guys have, have seen probably in the past, uh, we did a lot of work at Precision on vertical tillage in the early days, uh, comparing the soil finishers versus more vertical disc. And we're wanting to manage those soil uh, density changes. As we talked about roots bulking up in looser density, uh, we like running shallow and fast with a vertical tillage machine to get our seed bed prepped. And uh, with this kind of levelness, you got to love the finish behind these machines. Uh, we really love our, our rippers here and what job they do for us because we can blow across that once or twice depending on our conditions and we're set to go. Other questions? All right. Stephanie, how are we on time? Three minutes. Three minutes? Not too bad. Second session of the day. You guys are still the guinea pigs. You still get to go through the lunch line first, I think, after having to be this close to a ripper run at this speed. So. Yeah. Um, let Tony tackle that one. Yeah, so I had tipped this over before and we talked about we talked about this edge. This edge here is being critical, right? Like Tim mentioned, a good example of creating a schmear layer is you take that skid steer loader, then you put the bucket first. flat and you pull back on it. What do you see? Schmear, right? take that same bucket and turn it on its edge and pull it back, more than likely you're not going to see the same results, right? Because you're running on that edge, there isn't as much material, and that what creates smear is material going over the same area over and over again. So on the bullet point, it's designed that we keep this edge, and so the key is if this edge is wearing back to this wing support, 
then you would say the, the ripper is worn out or the point is worn out. If you still have a, a decent edge here along this and you're not basically worn back to where this support is, your point's still good. What you'll see too on wear, like I mentioned before, with the uh, fracture, the fractures coming out of the nose, you're gonna see more wear out here on the outside of the wing. That will wear back and you'll still keep the same width. Which is, it's really interesting because we've designed uh, the wing, the shape, and the weld uh, wire, or wire surfacing place that so that we keep that width. So if you still have a good edge on the bottom and that you haven't worn out this outside part, your, your ripper point's still good to go. If it's worn back to this support, it would be, it would be worn out. What is that edge wise? Yep, so we've done a lot of, uh, we, don't, we don't put a number on it. We would say all the testing we've done is we've just benchmarked what's out in the industry. So every test that we've done, we've always run, whether it's a Case IH, whether it's a Weiss, whether it's a Nichols, whether it's a John Deere laser rip, we've run against those in the same soil. So your soils are different everywhere, right? So depending on how long your ripper point lasts in your soil type, we would match that. So I've been in places in southwest Michigan where a Case IH point only lasts 400 acres, which is, I mean, that's a very good point as far as wear but they have very, very abrasive soil. Our point lasted the same amount, about 400 acres. Here in central Illinois, you know, typical season ripping as far as acreage, 15, 1800, maybe a little bit more, your point's gonna last the same. So it really is dependent upon that soil type, so we don't necessarily put a, a direct number on it. Okay, I think what, we need to let you more? go. Just one more. Uh, well, this wouldn't, this wouldn't be a vertical tillage machine. This is a, a disc ripper. So this, this point isn't considered at all kind of in the vertical tillage family. But in general, if your question is related to kind of what's the root pattern look like out of the machine, yep. we've looked at that a lot. We've dug root pits this season out of soil that we ran this ripper in last fall, and we don't see the roots even wiggle. They're going right through that, through that line where the, diff, uh, where the wing ran, basically. Good question. So, oh, a little bit of my personal experience, um, and remember on the timeline and progression of the bullet points you guys saw over on the ground over there, um, I was actually able to test the last prototype before we actually came to market. So, last fall, um, following some of our wheat ground in southern Michigan, uh, so wheat ground, uh, we have some really, really heavy clay soils, pretty compacted soils. So, you know... It, my personal experience said, hey, you know, that's a 14-inch that's a wing that I'm trying to pull through compacted, hard, dry clay. And I said, there's, there's absolutely no way. So we have a 235-horsepower tractor uh, that we're pulling a five-shank ripper um, on our home farm personally. And, you know, I, I was probably thinking along quite a few of the lines of what you are. There, there's just no way you can pull a 14-inch wing through there. Um, I will say time trials, you know, they did the horsepower, fuel requirements, all of that. Um, so very, very similar. Uh, in, in our perspective, that was uh, essentially no difference between those two points. So understanding that angle, the pitch that Tony was stressing to you in terms of importance, um, truly, truly impactful uh, to performance of that product.